Hello and welcome to the March 2021 virtual lecture of the Botanical Society of Scotland to be presented by Sean Hoban. It's been a beautiful day here in Edinburgh and it's still daylight outside. Spring is well on the way. I'm Julia Wilson, president of the Botanical Society. Now, Sean Hoban is our speaker tonight. He's linking to us online from the USA. That's a first for us. Sean has been tree conservation biologist at the Morton Arboretum in Illinois since 2016. And his interests include improving best practices for ex situ conservation, understanding the interactions between genetic diversity and the environment, and applying genetics to conservation policy and forest management. He's got a particular interest in oaks and magnolias. So he'll bring these threads together in his talk tonight. So over to Sean now. Great, thank you, Julia. Thank you everyone for coming. Can you hear and see me okay? Yes, uh, I'll assume that, that you can hear me OK. Um, so yes, thank you so much, everyone, for coming tonight. Um, really looking forward to speaking to you and I hope to uh, give you some interesting information and, and also answer your questions. So like Julia said, my name is Sean Hoban. I work at the Morton Arboretum, which is a botanic garden uh, in Illinois in the United States, and I'll be talking about how we can better conserve genetic diversity in our botanic garden collections. First, a little bit about the Morton Arboretum. We are a public botanic garden, so we're open to the public. We have over a million visitors per year, and we also have tens of thousands of students who come for school programs, field trips, um, and uh, class activities. We are members of our communities. We do tree planting training in tree care, as well as development of local tree ordinances and policy in the communities around Chicago. We are a center for tree science. We have um, some leading scientists in, in many areas of, of tree biology, as well as climate science, um, biomechanics and other areas. We have a tree breeding program especially focused on selections uh, for the urban environment. And we have amazing science communication and a really active global conservation program. As I've been working at the Morton Arboretum over the past five years, um, coming from a more academic background into the garden community, I've been thinking a lot about what gardens are for. I've been thinking about uh, our garden missions. And these are a few quotes from some botanic gardens, their mission statements. Um, of course, gardens exist for appreciation of beauty, um, diversity, learning, uh, and, and a place to, uh, just a place to go to, to experience uh, green environments. But really, in many of our mission statements, you also see a strong emphasis on conservation and conservation for the benefit of both nature and society. And as I've learned more about the garden community, uh, I've observed and, and come to understand that over the past 20 years, the garden community has shifted um, its focus more towards conservation. Uh, we are shifting from a focus more on pleasure gardens and um, uh, visual appreciation of, of uh, few individuals uh, from, from many tree species to um, collections with deep genetic diversity and collections that have conservation value, collections that can help solve our global challenges of biodiversity loss, uh, climate change, and food security. So collections that, for example, can produce uh, seed for ecological restoration or that can be studied to solve germination issues in rare species, or that can provide material for uh, plant breeding for the thousands of species known to be useful to humans. Paul Smith of Botanic Gardens Conservation International 
um, has said that botanic gardens are the strongest force for plant conservation in the world. And he has based this statement on, on some really important evidence, some unique attributes of botanic gardens, indeed a combination of attributes that are not found in any other institution. We have deep expertise in taxonomy, um, as well as horticulture, how to care for plants. We have a long tradition of expedition, exploration, and documentation, records that go back decades and sometimes centuries of what we've planted, how it performed, um, what diseases were observed, what plants did well together, how phenology and flowering of plants has changed with climate change. We have amazing outreach and volunteer opportunities. And we have the latest technology in tissue culture, in genomics, LIDAR, drones, uh, molecular biology, uh, technology that can really be used again to solve these global plant challenges. And these attributes of botanic gardens are really needed in, if we are to achieve our mission in plant conservation. So the challenges we face are that one in five plant species is threatened with extinction today, and that number is increasing. Even for those plants that aren't uh, on the brink of extinction, their populations are disappearing, their habitat is eroding, the genetic diversity that provides resilience to ecosystems is also disappearing, and only a small fraction of habitat and populations is protected. I'm going to mention three major challenges I think about a lot. They're not the only ones, but a couple of major challenges to plant conservation that we need to consider. Increasing pests and, and pathogens. Um, so in the US, we have approximately one new devastating pest or disease introduced every year. Um, these lines show uh, the US, Europe, and the UK and um, it's just a steady increase in, in the numbers of, of damaging plant pests and pathogens. Some of our most biodiverse areas are disappearing uh, due to logging and, and mining and conversion of, of tropical forests to agriculture. And we face the challenge of climate change and uh, not just warming, but major changes in fire, flooding, snowfall and snowpack. Um, which will make it harder for, for, plant, uh, for plants and, and their habitats to persist in the future. So in the face of these challenges and using the tools that Botanic Gardens uh, offer, my group at the Morton Arboretum works in four areas. We try to understand why uh, small populations are threatened. We work to understand if, if forests uh, and forest species will keep up with climate change. We work to come up with better measures for conservation progress and success, and we work on improving how we do ex situ conservation. And that's what I'll talk to you about today. I hope to leave you with four major messages from this talk. I hope to convince you that we can use genetic tools to actually measure how much genetic diversity we have in our botanic garden collections. We could do the same for protected areas or, or other uh, conservation efforts. Um, second, I want to show that we can uh, we can use other tools to discover general rules that seed collectors uh, and plant explorers can use uh, when collecting seed to bring it back to botanic gardens. I'm then going to talk about how we can use geographic information systems as a proxy or as a substitute for genetic data, because although genetic data continues to decrease in cost and, and is more and more accessible and powerful, we don't have it for all species. So I'll talk about kind of uh, quick decision-making tools. And then lastly, uh, I'll talk about questions, well, one, one or two major questions that remain unanswered, as well as some future work. I'll spend about 10 minutes on each of these, the first question will probably be a little more, closer to 12 or 15 minutes, and the others will be a little less. So just to catch 
uh, everyone up to speed. What do I mean? What is this word ex situ conservation? It means outside the natural habitat. Um, and it is sometimes necessary. Uh, it, of course, we must pursue in situ conservation, preservation of natural habitats and restoration of populations, but climate change, pests and diseases, and the loss of habitat sometimes means that plants cannot persist in their natural habitat. So we can keep them uh, in the top left. These are, this is called tissue culture. They're tiny plants that we can um, keep in this, these tiny containers actually for years. The next picture is cryopreservation. This is deep freezing at um, many <laughs> minus 80 or, or lower um, degrees. Uh, the, the next one down is seed banks. So these are seed packets, uh, which not all species can be preserved this way, but at least 80% of plant species can be kept in seed banks. And then we have plants in living collections. Uh, these are oaks at the Morton Arboretum. I focus on the genetic diversity in our uh, botanic gardens. There are other aspects of biodiversity. Of course, species diversity, phylogenetic diversity, trait diversity, um, but I focus on within species genetic diversity. And why is that important? Why do we need to conserve the genetic trait and ecological diversity across species distributions? Genetic diversity allows species to adapt. Uh, without it, they will not be able to survive ongoing challenges such as climate, pests, disease, pollution, habitat change, um, and other challenges. It is necessary for species to evolve. Genetic diversity of many thousands of species is useful for plant breeding. There are um, thousands of species just of known food use to humans, but also all kinds of other uses. Um, uh, and, and in particular, we're going to need the natural genetic diversity if we want plants to survive better in urban settings, if we want food security, and we want improved carbon sequestration. Genetic diversity, uh, we're learning more and more that genetic diversity, especially of trees and other habitat forming plants, makes entire ecosystems more stable and promotes greater species diversity. So it has really far reaching impacts beyond the survival of a given species. And genetic diversity is protected under numerous regional, national, and global um, initiatives. The challenge we face as seed collectors, as those who are trying to get genetic diversity into botanic gardens and seed banks, is we have limited resources, but we want to be effective. We want to make sure that important elements of biodiversity do not disappear. A little history, people have been working on this problem since before I was born. People started to tackle this problem of genetic diversity in collections during a time of rapid agricultural change. The industrialization of agriculture and homogenization of our food system presented agriculturalists with, um, they, they started to observe that the traditional land races that humanity had, had cultivated um, and had invented and used for thousands of years were disappearing. And this important ecological, biological, and, and cultural legacy was disappearing. So they wanted to come up with what are the really minimum number of, of plants per land race or per variety that we need to keep in our collections to use for the future. Uh, the idea is that these would be used for plant breeding. So they used um, some simple probability models to come up with a basic recommendation of number of samples to keep in a seed bank. Others have um, over the years improved upon these recommendations and tailored them to common or rare species. And uh, if you want to learn more about that, I have a little overview of the history of this in, in one of my previous um, papers, but we won't go more into history today. We'll just say that people have been working on this problem for quite a while. And I picked up on this problem about six or seven years ago, noticing that um, 
mostly people had developed the general rules that I just mentioned, like 50 samples per population. But plants have remarkable diversity. Plants have really different seed dispersal mechanisms, pollination mechanisms, different size and longevity, different geographic range size um, and commonness. How do these aspects of, of plant biology affect how we should keep them in collections, how we try to capture genetic diversity for conservation? So that's the background. These are the kinds of things I've been thinking about, and now I'm going to jump right into the, the, the four questions I want to address and four messages to give you. How much have we conserved in our botanic gardens today? Well, I'll tell you about a project led by Patrick Griffith. Uh, he's in the bottom, uh, bottom right of this photo right next to me. Uh, he's the executive director of Montgomery Botanical Center in Florida. We chose 11 species uh, across the plant tree of life, uh, two from each of five genera and then three from one of those genera. And we wanted to know how much genetic diversity is in botanic gardens. So how do we answer that question? We have to go out into wild populations, uh, find these rare plants and get as much tissue, uh, tissue from as many uh, individuals as possible to get a good idea of what kind of genetic diversity exists in the wild. We then go into our botanic gardens and we get uh, tissue from all the plants in our botanic gardens. We reached out to dozens of botanic gardens around the world to collaborate with us on this project. So then we're going to analyze this tissue in, in laboratory with, um, with DNA markers and we're going to have a set of DNA from the wild and a set from the gardens and we're just going to compare them. And we'll say what percentage of the genetic variants that exist in the wild are actually conserved in botanic gardens. There's a lot of um, methodological detail, a lot of sweat and time that went into this that we'll skip over and, and get right to the results. These are the number of plants for each of these 11 uh, rare species that uh, we were able to access in botanic gardens. In some cases, we don't have um, every plant that exists in botanic gardens of, of these species, but uh, we got as much as we could. And this is, uh, in some cases, a, a very good representation of what exists uh, for these species. So this is how much genetic diversity is actually conserved. Uh, in that number of samples. This is, it goes from zero to one. It's, it's just a proportion. So what does this mean? <laughs> what can we make of, of these numbers? Well, the global strategy for plant conservation says that we should be keeping at least 70% of a species genetic diversity in botanic gardens. And nine of our 11 taxa meet that. However, uh, the zoo community and the agricultural community um, advocate that 90 to 95% of genetic diversity is needed for a species long-term survival. Um, that's what the agriculturalists that I spoke about a few moments ago um, historically were aiming for. So only a few of our rare species in botanic gardens are meeting that standard. I should mention these 11 species are very charismatic. People have done a lot of work on them and, and they have fairly large collections. So many plant species, those that we didn't investigate, we can um, postulate that actually even less genetic diversity than this is, is conserved for most plant species. So what else can we infer from this data? Well, if we plot the number of plants on genetic diversity conserved, we see a pretty good relationship. The message is very clear. We need more trees uh, per species in our botanic gardens. Uh, that can be spread out. Again, these samples came in some cases from 10 or 20 different botanic gardens, but we need more plants of our rare species in botanic gardens. For many rare plants, there's a threshold somewhere between one and 200 where we're getting um, the majority in some cases, over 90% of the genetic diversity. So that is a good goal for us to aim for. I have complemented this uh, empirical investigation. So we were worked with 11 plant species, but there are hundreds of thousands of plant species in existence. 
Um, so I use simulations to simulate plant species with different characteristics. Um, and I have found that some characteristics mean we need larger collections in our botanic gardens, species with larger geographic ranges, more populations, more fragmentation of their habitat. We can, we know that these characteristics will mean we need larger collections for some species. And for species that flower rarely, we, we either need to get a lot more or come back more often to those populations with repeated uh, seed expeditions. So one uh, other example after that, after we did those 11 species, we worked with a little, uh, a slightly more common species. Um, uh, it's fairly widespread actually. This is a oak species that exists in um, sandy habitats in the central and western United States. It, it occurs across six U.S. states, which is a fairly large distribution, but its uh, populations are fragmented into this very specific habitat. So we did the same thing. We got DNA from the wild and DNA from the ex situ populations. You can see here there's a huge number, there's a large number of plants, uh, th almost 300 in botanic garden collections, but it's not getting much genetic diversity. So it's well below that curve predicted by these more rare plants. Um, so this tells us again that these more common species are going to need more samples in botanic gardens if we want to sufficiently protect their genetic diversity. And I should mention this work um, was done with several um, people who worked in my lab here, Bethany Zimwalde and, and Bailey Munoz. So that brings us up to a total of four oaks, but really um, what we want to do next is a deep dive into the Quercus genus. We want to um, understand for a given genus that it has the same basic seed dispersal mechanism, same pollination mechanisms, same habit of growth generally, uh, some variance in size, but definitely variance in, in commonness. We're going to do this same process of getting DNA from the wild and from botanic gardens and then looking at how much we've conserved and how much we need to conserve of these uh, of the Quercus genus. And this will be done by um, my current research assistant, Emily Schumacher, shown here. So far, I've told you how much is in botanic gardens and what are these kind of minimum numbers that we should be aiming for. Well, the other side of collecting is not just the minimum numbers, it's how we do our collecting. And as I've been now on a few seed uh, collecting expeditions myself, I know very well that botanists and seed collectors are very biased in where we go. We go to places that are beautiful, that are well known generally, or at least uh, documented and often near roads or trails. Um, and places that people have been before and, and found the plants that we are looking for. So our seed collections are tend to be, not always, but tend to be biased, um, which means we're not getting as much genetic diversity as we might. And the same thing goes for other conservation efforts. Often our protected areas or other conservation efforts are um, biased by uh, certain factors. So the question is, um, what advice can we give for, for doing better collecting? And if we did better collecting, how much more genetic diversity could we get? What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, this is Quercus pointonii. It's native to a few counties in, in the U.S. state of Alabama. I'm going to show you how much genetic diversity we have in current collections and how much we could have based on a simulation of really ideal sampling where we visited all the wild populations and did um, a thorough sampling within these populations, getting as many maternal trees as possible. So currently we have 70% of genetic diversity conserved, but with a really good sampling, we could have gotten a lot more, 94%, in the same number of individuals. So our collections could capture a lot more genetic diversity, but really be the same size if we did um, more thorough geographic sampling from the start. So I calculated this across all uh, of the species we looked at and found that on average we could get a 40% improvement. 
Now, in conservation, we're often looking to improve things by one or five or 10%. So 40% improvement in our conservation effectiveness is really big. Um, so this really stresses the importance of future seed expeditions to visit places that haven't been visited before and to get seed from as many maternal plants as possible. So to recap the first part of the talk, the longer part of the talk, I've shown you that there's a large variance in how much genetic diversity is conserved in our botanic gardens today, uh, between 40 and 95 percent. Um, a lot of that is due to the number of plants, so we need more plants in our botanic gardens and we can use what we know about plant traits to predict whether a given species might need more in our botanic gardens than others. And we can get a lot more genetic diversity with careful planning of how we do our seed expeditions. Next, I want to talk to you about um, not precise numbers of, of minimum sample size, but other general rules we can uncover for seed collecting. And I'm going to use Fraxinus excelsior, a common species that many of you may know. Um, it's either the first or second most common uh, by number and volume uh, in, in the UK, very economically important and ecologically important. It's disappearing, as you may know, due to the ash dieback disease caused by a fungus. And the UK Native Tree Seed Project, uh, led by Q and the Millennium Seed Bank, have collected millions of ash seed over the past five to 10 years. And uh, I was working with them, we were interested to know how much genetic diversity is captured in that much seed. Well, unlike the rare species that I talked about in the first part of the talk, we can't get genetic data on the millions of trees that exist in the wild or the millions of seed that are in collections. So I built a model uh, to simulate genetic diversity across the UK um, and to predict which populations would have more genetic diversity. Uh, and that's based on the basically the species abundance. So looking at using this model and the exact locations where seed samplers did actually visit, uh, we were able to predict that over 90% of genetic diversity is conserved. And if we looked at locally common diversity, um, which might represent local adaptations, it was over 94%. So, a very good collection of this common species. What else could we do with this model? Well, we can use the same model to test out different sampling strategies. So what if sampling had been done in a different way? What if completely random sampling was done? Or um, what if all the sampling was done in the southern part of the UK or the northern part or the edge or the center of the species range? So we tested all these different strategies and as expected, random performs best, but actually numerous strategies, as long as one is visiting quite a few populations um, and not just restricted to, to one corner of the species range, numerous spatial strategies could do a really good job for the species. I then started to think about what are the constraints that a seed collector faces? We have constraints on the size of the seed bank as well as uh, time spent in the field, um, personnel curating the seed bank, uh, money. So I then simulated spatial, uh, sorry, I simulated seed sampling strategies that feature trade-offs. So do we visit more populations or get more trees per population? Kind of a different way of uh, spending one's effort. Uh, time within a population versus visiting more populations. And I found this thing that I call genetic equivalencies, where multiple strategies that are very different in how you allocate your effort can get the same genetic goal. So here, one could visit fewer populations, get more trees per population, and an overall bigger uh, sample size, or more populations with fewer trees per population and a smaller overall size. And actually both of these very different strategies can reach a similar genetic outcome. 
And we see there are other trade-offs in, in conservation, such as how we locate protected areas. Um, one could do the same thing for designing protected areas to protect, protect genetic diversity, trade-offs between you know, the size and number of protected areas. So I think this genetic equivalencies and, and the different parts of the geographic range suggest we have a lot of flexibility in how sampling strategies are designed. There's not just one best strategy. Then I started to think about um, a really different way of designing seed collections. So everything I've told you about so far focuses on achieving an end goal. In the first part of the talk, it was 95% of the genetic diversity. What if instead of reaching a defined goal, um, getting to that 95% target, we stopped collecting at a point where our effort has gotten us um, about as much as we can get without uh, spending a lot more effort to get more. So this is a concept of an optimal stopping point. In conservation, like most things in life, you see these kinds of curves called diminishing returns curves where you get a lot with your first bit of effort and gradually that gain with per unit effort decreases. So if we take these curves, uh, which were generated by the same simulation, um, and we can look for what point on these curves, on average, do we reach uh, less than a given amount of gain in genetic diversity or improvement for the next unit effort. So I tested, you know, what is the slope of the tangent to these curves at every point, and I found that uh, it's about 30 populations and 30 trees per population. That is a optimal stopping point. We compared that to um, what the foresters uh, had proposed in, in their original seed sampling um, gu guidance document, and they had proposed 15 populations and uh, sorry, 50 populations and 15 trees per population, which actually this is very close <laughs> uh, within a factor of two. Um, so the intuition of the foresters in, in designing the seed collection was very close to an optimal stopping point. Lastly, um, another thing we can talk about with seed sampling is, do we sample bigger populations more than smaller populations? So with Fraxinus uh, excelsior in the UK, the northern populations are often small and isolated. Do we sample less in them? So we did simulations of, of different sampling strategies. Each of these colored dots or colored beads shows a different sampling strategy. And on average, if you apply the same sampling strategy in a small isolated population, you'll get more genetic diversity than in a more central larger population. This tells us that yes, indeed, we can sample less and get the same amount of genetic diversity for these smaller isolated populations. An undergraduate in our lab, Kaylee Rosenberger, has uh, done some simulations of uh, more rare species. So again, this is based on Fraxinus excelsior, but she's done the same kind of thing for more rare species and shown that indeed you um, should be sampling proportional to population size. So more in larger populations and less in smaller ones. So to recap, uh, well, I should mention if, if you're really intrigued in this Fraxinus excelsior example, there's actually a lot I didn't get to tell you. It's, it's um, one of my uh, more involved and in, in bigger projects I've done. And, and so if you want to look at that publication, there's a lot more you can explore and, and learn about. But to, to recap, I was able to test um, how we choose locations to visit across the species range. And I was able to um, really determine how we allocate our effort among populations, trees, and then among large and, and small populations. Again, to, to lead to a better conservation outcome. So consider another situation. We don't have genetic data because genetic is, data is still is fairly expensive, and we don't have the time and expertise and, and knowledge of, of species abundance and uh, to build a nice genetic model representing a species. What are, what is a tool we can use 
to de design seed sampling expeditions that does not require genetic data at all. Well, we know that on average, the further apart populations are and the more they are in different habitats, the more genetic differences there are among those populations. So geography might to some degree predict genetic diversity. So my colleagues I've been working with uh, at the Morton Arboretum, this was really led by them. Uh, I played a small role, but Emily Beckman and Dr. Murphy Westwood, who I've been working with, um, they, they've, they've been at the Arboretum for about six years working on this project. Their method um, is based on making a map of where the wild populations exist of given species, then placing on that map the locations where we know that seeds have been collected, and then calculating what we call a coverage metric. So say there are 10 populations in existence that are not overlapping, and we have sampled seed. We know we have sampled seed and, and gotten those seed into botanic gardens from four of those sites. That would be a coverage of about 40%. And um, I should mention we've been inspired by and, and developed our methods in tandem with um, Colin Cowrie, who's, who's applied, who really pioneered this method and has applied it mostly to crop wild relatives. Our approach differs slightly from his, but, but is, is very similar. So this is what that looks like. The white circles are the species range where observations of a species have been made. Um, some of these locations we're less sure about uh, than others, especially some of these outlying locations, but generally this is our picture of the geographic range. The black circles are where we have samples, um, have sampled for seed for botanic gardens. The percent that the black circles cover of the white circles is the geographic coverage. That's 29% for this species. This is Quercus georgiana or Georgia oak. What is the ecological coverage and what are all these colors? So each color is a um, a different what we call ecoregion. It's defined by rainfall, by the dominant vegetation, by altitude and slope uh, and temperature. Um, these were developed by our Environmental Protection Agency and, and are used widely in, in ecology. So if populations occur in a given ecoregion, we might assume they have different adaptations genetic based adaptation. So we can count the number of white circles that overlap with a given color or ecoregion and then the same thing for the black circles, count that and then take a ratio. In this case, it's 41%. And then we could take an average of the geographic and ecological coverage. So this is pretty good, but what the real uh, magic of this method is we can scale it up really easily. Uh, using geographic information software. Um, so Emily Beckman uh, has been working on this for several years now, and she's applied it now to most of the rare Quercus in the United States. Here are a few examples. And these are the results. We again showing uh, here on the x-axis is divert genetic diversity, and then each species on the y-axis, the dark blue is geographic coverage and the light blue is ecological coverage. What's important is you can see some species, Quercus acerifolia, Quercus lobata, are very well conserved for geographic and ecological coverage. And some species are not. So we can use this type of plot, uh, this type of tool to identify uh, the next species that need to be collected to really boost their ecological and geographic coverage. So for example, Quercus similis, Carmenensis, Pumila, Sedrosensis, Ostrina, these are some of our next priorities for collecting. Um, but there are some species we've done a very good job on and can kind of set aside uh, in our prioritization. And we have put this into practice uh, with our own efforts. So this is our curator, Matt Lobdell, uh, shown here, uh, making an herbarium voucher. The Morton Arboretum, along with five or six botanic gardens and other partners, um, applied for funding from a, a unique opportunity from the American Public Gardens Association and the U.S. Forest Service. They fund seed collections 
four species that cannot be seed banked that have to be kept alive in botanic gardens as living plants. Um, and they have started to really advocate that our method for geographic prioritization is, is the way to choose where those seed collections can be done. So um, they have made several seed collections of Quercus georgiana, same species I mentioned, um, to visit new populations and get more of the geographic and presumably genetic diversity of the species. Uh, and we have now have hundreds of, of seedlings growing in our greenhouses as well as greenhouses in all of our partner botanic gardens. The idea is that these will then be grown at even dozens of botanic gardens around the US, really making the species much more secure for conservation. Most recently, Emily Beckman has started to look beyond Quercus at some other priority genera, uh, tree genera that are really important ecologically or horticulturally or, um, uh, or cor culturally, um, uh, as well as economically. So juglans is shown here, some of the US juglans, uh, caria, uh, the laurels, taxis, Vegas or beach. Um, and if we put all, all of these together, these are, you know, she's also looked at Pinus, um, but it's, it's so recent we don't have a, a plot of that yet. But you can see there's a large variance um, in the ecological and, and geographic coverage among the species as well as among genera. And some of our next work is going to be to, so we can use this to prioritize, you know, which species need to be collected most, the next, but also to figure out why some species are conserved better than others, which can then help us you know, also predict what we need, what types of species need to be collected more. So to recap this part of the talk, we can use um, geographic information systems to prioritize the most important species as well as where we collect. And we are already putting this into action in partnership with many botanic gardens and the American Public Gardens Association and US Forest Service to get a lot more genetic diversity of our priority trees into botanic gardens. So I mentioned that there were some unanswered questions. And these unanswered questions revolve around conservation philosophy. And I use the term philosophy because um, it is the answer to these questions will um, be partly related to what we value. So what are we trying to conserve anyways? I've used this term genetic diversity throughout the talk, but there is different kinds of genetic diversity. Some genetic variants, uh, like certain traits that you see uh, in humans as well as plants, are rare. Um, it takes a lot more effort to get all of the genetic diversity of a species because the rare ones are, are very hard to find. So do we need to protect every allele? That's, that's a term for a genetic variant. That's the first major philosophical question. The second philosophical question is, how much do we need to back up our collections? How secure do they need to be? Everything I've told you in the talk so far assumes that we just need one copy of every genetic variant. But if we only have one copy, it's very susceptible to being lost, especially as we have more and more disasters. These disasters that affect our natural environments also uh, affect our gardens. We've had gardens um, really almost destroyed by fire and hurricane uh, and other disasters in, in the past years. We lost our entire ash collection to emerald ash borer. It was one of our uh, most important collections um, and is now gone. We could not save it. So how much do we need to back up genetic diversity in our collections? So I am not going to answer these two questions. What kind of genetic diversity and, and how much to back it up? But I'm going to show you why those are important questions. I'm going to show you in this plot the minimum sample size needed depending on the type of genetic diversity on the right will be harder to collect genetic diversity in, but presumably more important for the species survival. And uh, going up and down is the amount that the collection is backed up. So assuming no backup, just one copy or five copies, 
And in my publication, I've extended this table down to 10 and 20 and even 50 uh, duplicates. For example, for Praxinus Excelsior, we're using that for breeding program and reintroduction and things like that. So we need many, many, many copies. OK, but I'm just going to use this as a demonstration. These are the minimum numbers needed for each of those philosophical goals. Within um, a cell is the variance in sample size due to species biology. That's everything I told you about in the first part of the talk. How big is the range? How many populations? What's its pollination biology? It's substantial. This is important. But this is the range due to the philosophy, due to our decisions about these two aspects of what we need to conserve and, and how much we need to back it up. So almost 50 times larger uh, the collection would have to be depending on these philosophical uh, or value-based decisions. So to summarize, uh, the philosophical or value-based questions really matter. It really actually has maybe the greatest influence on how much we need to keep in our botanic garden collections with you know, greater than 10 times larger collections for the same species, depending on these questions. So, um, but all is not lost. It's not just uh, armchair philosophy that we have to do. We can actually answer to some degree uh, these questions. I mentioned at the very beginning that botanic gardens have decades or even centuries of records of what we planted and what we've lost. Uh, that includes uh, records of disaster or disease or just um, old age for plants. So we can use this past data as well as projections on whether that threat will get worse in the future to predict how often we lose trees uh, and therefore how much we need to back them up or duplicate them. And as we learn more and more about genomics, we will probably learn more and more about what kind of genetic vari var variants are most important. So I think these uh, questions are solvable in the very near future. So a couple things about future work I want to mention. I've been thinking more and more about if our collections are actually useful. One use of our collections can be to produce seed for ecological restoration um or reintroduction of populations to have that happen well for many species you need to have multiple individuals of the same species so they can pollinate each other not in all cases but um often that's good and ideally these would be unrelated individuals uh so they're not making inbred seed that would be less fit uh the Plants will have to be of reproductive age, so not seedlings, but also not too old, and also in an environment where they're producing seeds. So we have uh, some plants that survive very well in Chicago, but the growing season is not long enough for the seeds to fully mature. So the main point is not all plants in our botanic gardens are useful for this goal of restoration. The other thing is this graph shows um, not all of the plants in collections are in the country of origin. So if we wanted to uh, plant a certain walnut species uh, for restoration in the US, we could get seed uh, from the UK or, or France or, or elsewhere in the world or Brazil, or um, but it's a little harder to, you know, there's a lot more paperwork and, and challenges with moving seed across borders. So um, it would be more useful if, for restoration if the seed were in the country of origin. So this is what I want to work on next is quantifying what proportion of our collections actually meet these different criteria. Uh, the other thing that, that's being worked on, and this is more the work of Murphy Westwood at, at the Morton Arboretum, is um, in uh, actually led by Botanic Gardens Conservation International is uh, consortia, better coordination among botanic gardens. This graphic on the bottom shows uh, some of the rare oaks of the US and how many plants are in collections. And on the far right, we see many species with very few individuals in collections. The stars means those are IUCN red list threatened with extinction. 
the message of this graphic is that our most threatened species are those with the fewest plants in collections. So we need to coordinate among botanic gardens to say who is going to take charge of these rare species and who is doing the seed collections to make sure that we're not all going out and getting seed from a species we've actually conserved really well in botanic gardens. So improving communication and collaboration among botanic gardens is very important. And there are these uh, consortium that have been established by Botanic Gardens Conservation International in different genera for that purpose. Another uh, future um, work to be done is improvements to our databases. So in addition to communication among Botanic Gardens, it's nice if we can all share information um, in an automated way about what's in our collections. So there is such a database, it's called BGCI Plant Search. It is over a thousand botanic gardens globally, uh, what species are in them, um, but it doesn't have all the information we needed for the kind of work we did. Uh, it doesn't often have the geographic location that the seed was sampled from. It doesn't uh, often have information about how old the specimen is, if it's healthy, if it's producing seed. Um, so to do our work, we had to write to individual botanic gardens and they filled out a survey and it took a lot of work to get those surveys back and then clean them, put them all in the same format. So Botanic Gardens Conservation International um, and Abby Meyer in collaboration with numerous uh, botanic gardens is working to um, have a plant search 2.0, which will have much more up-to-date and much more detailed information about what's in botanic gardens. So we can really even do a better job of assessing how much we've conserved. And we can do that in real time. We could do it every year or every six months and really see how things are changing over time. I mentioned genomics. As we get more and more knowledge of genomics, um, we can improve all of the work I talked to you about today. So everything I talked to you about today um, does not focus on what we call um, uh, ge genetic adaptations or alleles that can improve the fitness of a species in a given environment. Uh, we're still learning about genomic adaptation, but soon we'll be able to incorporate that knowledge into, for example, the models I built for Fraximus excelsior, um, maybe to build in adaptation to colder or saltier or uh, other environments environmental challenges. And the last uh, area of future work is uh, doing more work on outreach and communications. This has been a direction I've been moving in for two or three years now. I was formerly in an academic and still am very academic in, in what I do. But um, being in the garden, I, I now have many more audiences than I had before. So. Uh, I have audiences like this is a newsletter for our general um, visitors. And then we also have audiences of people who are planting trees for restoration. We uh, work with ecologists, we work with community organizers. So engaging multiple audiences with uh, sometimes complex data is uh, a challenge I'm excited to work on um, now and in the future. So some examples of that, I've started to, along with colleagues, translate my research findings into more accessible formats. So here on the left are a couple of policy briefs translating our work into the context of um, global conservation and the Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, 2021 is a very big year for global conservation policy. So we've done a few of these policy type briefs um, on the right are um, publications uh, for botanic garden visitor audience or for people who work at botanic gardens. Um, again, in a more attractive format and, and a simpler format that really boils down the main messages and makes them accessible. And I have been working with colleagues around the world um, to translate some of our most important efforts into numerous languages so that they're accessible because uh, many people around the world don't speak English, so we've really worked hard to um, 
have translations of our very short uh, policy outputs. And I will continue to do that in the future. So um, I've spoken for about 15 minutes. Uh, I just want to thank the many people I've worked with over the years, uh, the different places I've worked, my PhD advisor, people I worked with in my postdocs, my many colleagues throughout Europe and my lab who were involved in many of these projects. Um, the funders who have supported this work. And to summarize, what did I tell you today? I told you there's a wide variation in how much genetic diversity is currently conserved. Some species are conserved very well, but not so many. And it's likely that most species are, are not meeting our conservation genetic thresholds. We can do a lot better with um, how we sample in space by visiting more populations and be much more efficient in what we have in botanic gardens. We can um, use models to develop uh, optimal strategies. When do we stop our efforts? What populations are most important to visit? And how do we tailor uh, our efforts to the constraints of the organization, whether that be logistical or spatial or financial constraints? We can use geographic methods to assess um, what is likely the genetic conservation status of many species very quickly and plan our next seed sampling efforts. And we have important gaps to be solved, particularly around our values of what genetic diversity can serve and how much to back it up. In summary, we can use these different data sources, genetic data, genetic models, geographic maps, and other tools to better conserve genetic diversity in botanic gardens um, with benefits to nature, uh, science, and uh, society. So thank you very much, and I'm ready for some questions. Well, thank you, Sean. Um, that's very informative and a very comprehensive and multifaceted talk. There was a tremendous amount of work going in there. Now, there's a few questions popping up. Um, uh, someone asks, do you consider the reproductive, re reproductive system when you do your sampling? Uh, species that reproduce vegetatively like aspens, uh, do they have to be sampled from different areas of their ranges? And what do you think about species, apomictic species? How do you deal with those? So we do have to um, take into account um, species reproductive biology. So for example, species that are clonal um, or not producing uh, sexually, not producing seed, um, we generally have to space out our samples much more. Um, uh, this is a challenge. It really, for such species, it, it really helps to have genetic data from that species or a similar species to know how large the clones are and, and thus how much you have to distribute your samples on, on the landscape. So it is important to continue to have uh, genetic studies of such species to, to help guide the sampling. Okay, thank you. Um, now, this is a question actually from me when you were talking about ash and the devastating effects of the emerald tree bore, borer. Um, how can you actively conserve trees when you um, have these terrible problems with persistent pests and virulent diseases uh, going through your collections? What do you do about it? Yes, um, there is an there are several insecticide treatments for the emerald ash borer. Uh, they're uh, expensive, but not so expensive. <laughs> I mean, it, it depends. We, we, um, the emerald ash borer came through so quickly, and and I think at the time this was more than ten years ago that the insecticides weren't uh, maybe available, but they are available now. And high value trees in um, in cities and high value trees in particularly sensitive habitats can be treated with the insecticide. It's injected into the trunk of the tree once every year or two years. Um, it costs between 50 and 100 US dollars per tree per year, which again, to maintain a tree that is 100 or hundreds of years old is really irreplaceable and might have an ecosystem value of 
many thousands of dollars, it, it, it can be worth it. Um, so we have done some genetic work to actually with the Forest Service to help them decide how many trees um, in very important habitats uh, should be treated um, with the insecticide. And, and cities are doing the same thing. So I hope that answered the question. Yeah, thank you. Now, uh, David Burslem from Aberdeen asks, says many botanic gardens share seeds often informally. Should this be regulated to ensure that only genetically diverse seeds are distributed? Um, I think what is needed more than regulation is, is more collaboration among botanic gardens, more of these uh, consortia where we um, decide together uh, what are the major gaps? So, so it, in some sense, the more seeds are distributed, um, the more they are backed up in, di in, in different botanic gardens. Um, I, I wouldn't say that should be restricted uh, as such, um, just because it's informal. Um, but the more plants we grow, the better. But um, it is good if more and more botanic gardens can join these consortia so that we can uh, make these decisions together. Um, with the current generation of curators of botanic gardens, I think that's starting to be recognized. We can do a lot better uh, working together. OK, now uh, moving on, a question from Maria Chamberlain. She asks, is there a danger that plants grown in botanic gardens and then reintroduced to wild places where it's now lost or endangered? Might these plants uh, introduce some foreign genes acquired in the garden by hybridization? Hybridization is a challenge uh, that I really uh, think about a lot and I want to work more on in the future. Um, it's, it's certainly possible. Uh, there are, uh, the more I think about it, the, the more I think it's likely that we even do have some hybrids in our botanic gardens that might be labeled uh, as one thing, but, but actually be a hybrid um, because they were collected from another botanic garden in the past before we had genetic tools and, and really thought so much about this. Um, but reintroducing them into the wild, yes, that, that is certainly a possibility. So for our, for our rarest species, um, so some of our rare oaks, there's only a couple hundred trees in the wild. We plan to either do controlled pollination where we take pollen, put it on a flower, bag the flower so no other pollen can get in. So we call that um, controlled pollination. Then you know what that seed is and, and that it's not a hybrid. Uh, we plan to do either that or to do genetic tests um, before re reintroducing or releasing uh, the seedlings. Um, alternatively, if, if you grow a given species in a botanic garden and you know there's no other related species nearby or uh, not many, um, you know that, that you know that that risk is low and then you, you could just use the seed. So those are a few methods you could do uh, to prevent that from happening. That being said, uh, in some cases, um, gene flow does occur naturally. So for oaks, we know that gene flow some degree does occur naturally and in some cases um, the hybrid uh, would, would not be such a problem and, and maybe even could have some advantageous genes in some cases. Yeah, there's a, sort of quite a problem in different ways, isn't there, about um, how much do you know about your collection and how much do you need to know about your collection if you're then going to start um, passing seeds out to, to, for replanting and conservation. Now, um, Max Coleman asks, whole genomes may not be that far away. What difference would that make to your approach? It will make a tremendous difference. Um, so we did our, our genotyping was with a, an older marker system because we were working with some older data sets. They're called microsatellites and, and they're, they've been around for 20 years, um, maybe almost 30 years. Um, and don't have a lot of detailed resolution. The cost per sample was about $10 per sample and, and now whole genomes are, uh, we recently had a quote for 
a couple of hundred dollars per whole genome. So there's still a, a factor of 10 or more difference, but the whole genome has a huge amount more uh, information. So it will allow us to know much more confidently which trees are our siblings or are related to each other in the gardens. It will allow us to look at uh, those adaptive genes that I talked about. So, so far, we have not done any optimization of our strategies based on adaptations and whole genomes will give us a, a lot of that information. So we are um, even now close to, to moving towards that in, in terms of cost uh, and, and benefit. Yes. OK, coming on from the idea about um, needing to know more about your plants and so on. Um, we know that, uh, for instance, you collect seed from different habitats. Some of it will be better adapted to cold conditions or day length or numerous other environmental parameters. So how much of a problem is the absence of adaptation in ex situ collections where you you can't really test for that? Mm -hmm. uh, this this is um, something we face in uh, that is faced in the zoo community as well and, and much more so in the zoo community in terms of behavioral adaptations. But when we grow up, uh, there's two problems. One is when we grow up seed in a botanic garden, we might even be selecting for the garden conditions. So um, one big issue is uh, when we pick out seedlings. So some seeds um, take a lot longer to germinate than others. And so if you wait a few weeks, see most of them have germinated. You collect the seedlings you have and dispose of everything else here, losing that genetically based determination for germination time if you don't wait long enough, which can, you know, that can be an important mechanism for surviving drought or, or flood or um, seed dispersal. Uh, so that's just one example of how we can inadvertently select in the botanic garden community uh, uh, conditions, um, how we water, how we fertilize or, or other uh, factors. Uh, that can be a really big problem. And so the restoration community about five years ago, put out the best guidelines for um, kind of how we select and, and how we do the best we can to not um, have such artificial selection when we grow things in gardens or, or more importantly in you know, large production systems. Um, so there are some guidelines that can help prevent that. It could be a really serious issue that could lead to um, reduced adaptation in, in, in the future. Uh, so um, the other thing is if we grow them for multiple generations in the garden, we can just lose genetic diversity randomly because some plants might make more seed than others. So there's a few factors and it. it can be really important. Thank you. Now, um, another question from Max. Uh, and this is something you touched on towards the end of your talk. Um, as many gardens don't have seed banks and the number of unique accessions in living collections is typically well below the numbers you advise. The only um, way good diversity is conserved is by coordinated effort across gardens, as you, you pointed out. Um, now, you showed some examples of um, what looked like um, pretty good collaboration between gardens if you added up all their collections together and others where there were great big holes, so to speak, in, in collections. If you um, think about this question in general, do you think that um, we still have a long way to go in making sure that we conserve sufficient diversity or, you know, are we 50% there or are we only 20% there? I think we have a long way to go um, uh, so that most species genetic diversity would be conserved ex situ. Um, 
Well, we can conserve about 80% of species in seed banks. Um, they have their own disadvantages though. So even for them, it's important to have some in, in living collections. Um, I think we have a long way to go, but um, we have, there's about 3000 botanic gardens globally, um, which could collectively hold um, probably millions of plants at least, maybe tens of millions, somewhere between a million and, and 10 million plants, just uh, back of the envelope. Um, so we could get many thousands of plant species very well conserved for their genetic diversity um, through coordination without having more or, or bigger gardens. Uh, of course, it's good <laughs> as we uh, have more gardens, especially in uh, tropical areas. Um, but the current capacity could do a very good job. It, it will involve some important decisions about some removal of some individuals. So there are, you know, in, in, in the United States anyways, every botanic garden, you know, has a ginkgo collection and um, uh, bald cypress collection. And, and uh, there are some <laughs> really, really, really common species that uh, we can make some decisions about uh, removing to, to make room for the more uh, conservation value uh, collections. Thank you. Now, you talked tonight about trees. Do you think the issues are similar for uh, plants, other plants with different sorts of life strategies and so on? Uh, yes, uh, definitely. Um, most of this applies to, to, to many plants. Um, we we didn't include cycads. Um, they ha they are um, sometimes considered trees. Um, but anyways, we we did include species that have very different size and stature and commonness and different modes of pollination of animal or or seed or, or wind pollinated. Um, conserving grasses uh, will be different and, and conserving highly clonal species will be different. Uh, conserving different ploides will be different. Um, I haven't tackled all of those with different case studies and simulations. The, the big messages that are on the slide right now uh, will apply to most plants, but we will have different rules um, potentially for, for the different uh, aspects I just mentioned. Well, thank you, Sean. I can't see any more questions coming in. Um, so thank you for the, it's been a very comprehensive talk and I, I think that for many of us it's told us a lot more about the work of uh, botanic gardens than we'd previously realised. Um, so I'd now like to thank you and to thank our audience who've come along tonight and asked questions and participated. So to all our audience, if you missed the start or you want to watch again, you can you'll find this lecture up on our YouTube in a few days time. So good night and thank you for watching. <laughs>